So today it's my great pleasure to be speaking with Dr. Woody Johnson. Woody's a licensed licensed uh, clinical hey, psychologist and has got private practices in Los Angeles. He's also a trading psychologist. So the way I came across Woody was is a specialist trading psychologist helping traders of the markets, the financial markets, get their understanding about themselves correct so that when they trade, they're doing it from a um, the best place possible. And of course, part and parcel of all that is dealing and helping men and women across the globe deal with fear and greed and managing that so that they can be the best they can be um, and avoid bankruptcies, which um, you know are common in that financial industry when people don't have their head together. He holds certificates in accelerated learning, neurosensory development, and NLP. And he's, uh, he's taught many uh, graduate psychology courses at institutions, for example, the Pacific Oaks College and Roy Orkin College. Now, this is where it gets interesting. He's currently the president of Peak Performance 2000, which is a center for sensory development and human potential. It provides for development of the brain-mind senses using sound and language. The center incorporates the latest neuroscientific technologies for transformation, change, and internal balancing to accomplish maximum of creative, uh, maximization of creative personal performance. Dr. Woody's been using mind-body healing techniques, which much, much success for many years, and I'm a beneficiary of that. I have to say that up front. And he's the author of the book, specially written for the trading industry, which is From Pain to Profit. We'll hear more about his book as we go through. From Pain to Profit, Secrets of the, of the Peak Performance Trader, and also Turning Your Stress into Your Best. Fantastic to see you again, Woody Johnson. Thank you for coming to the show. Always a pleasure, David. Really glad to be here with you. Yeah. And, well, and, and I want to send out a hello and a hearty uh, uh, be well and be safe to all of your listeners out there and across the planet. I'm sure yeah. you've got thousands. Yeah, we've got thousands. It might be millions. Who knows? It's growing all the time. Oh, uh, yes, yeah, right. It's, it's, by the time it gets out, it's going to be millions. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, that's right. yeah. Well, we're, we're on a movement uh, to build a community of men. I, I know you noticed. Uh, I was going to say something real quick about it. I got this capital with the LA. You know, the LA is the world champion uh, baseball. Yeah, the Dodgers. For those for those of your listeners who really, I mean, a lot of them like like cricket. I know, but uh, uh-huh. <laughs> that's right. But baseball, you know, it's that that little that little sport off to the side. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> well, it's all good news in LA. Yes. Um, and obviously, what we're doing in Manship is we're building a community of men because you know, Woody. I think if we were to have a fireside chat about this, I, I'm pretty sure you might agree with some or all of these points. When men have difficulties in their life, in whatever sphere that's in, whether it's relationships, money, uh, drugs and alcohol, or when they get older and we start to kind of, we can lose just by force of gravity, the way our body works and also how our mind works, men can sort of think, right, problem, I'll go in and I'll fix it myself. And we go into our little cave. Women on it, by contrast to that, will often gather their friends and, and be able to maybe select different friends for the different type of Thing they need to work out. This person's good at that stuff. This one, I won't talk to that one. They're, they're better off on, you know, so, and they're very gregarious and can sort their problems. But man shit's about creating a community. So men can come in and say, hey, listen, I'm just here. This is this stuff's going on. Because I, I can I know, and I, I know you know, is that for men, if we're not going through it, being, you know, if we're not going through it right now, we've been through it. We're going to be going through it in these challenges in our life. And so it's always good to have a community. And then the purpose of our interviews with inspiring people like yourself who are working at a very high level is to cause and give a, a, a way for guys to get inspired and get back on track. So an example in your, and this is where I've come to know you well, is that you you work with trading uh, specialists and, and people wanting to become traders and become consistently profitable. Someone says, hey, listen, Woody, I come to you, Woody. I've got to be honest. I'm, I've got all this psycho babble happening, and it's stopping me really being fulfilling my potential as a trader. Let's have a chat and let's get into it. Some structured um, work between the two of you, and that's so we get the inspiration at that point, and then we can actually move ahead with that part of our life. So I really thank you for coming on. I know there's a lot of traders listen to this program, and um, you're a you're a trading psychologist. So um, can you just give us the introduction, and particularly about your book? Uh, specifically written for the trading community. How's the book going and your new book as well? Well, go with the new book first. Uh, working on it, and I've gotten a good substantial bit of the uh, the research and stuff. And, and the new 
thoughts because it's been a little while since the last one was written. Yep. Uh, but to get back to that one, and and this new one will be a little bit more in terms of the underpinning, uh, some of the neuroscience and some of the uh, perspectives that I've, uh, and uh, through working with my clients, have come across with regard to their importance to the process. For instance, just starting out with a frame. And I've, always, I've often talked about the frame being important. And it's, and, well, it's, it's, it's everything because it sets the stage, it sets the tenor, it sets the tone mm. for how you're going to conceptualize mm. what you're about to get into, whatever it happens to be, whether it's something athletic or something uh, cerebral or something professional. Mm. Uh, when we're starting a new endeavor, it's important for us to have a, a working understanding of how we're going to be in relationship with it. Mm -hmm. So some of those types of thoughts and, and, and others went into are, are going into the, the new book. Um, the uh, uh, from pain to profit really came out of my pain. Mm -hmm. uh, I was I was really screwing up royally. I, I lost a lot of money, and I was partly fueled by the arrogance that came out of thinking that because I'm a, a trained psychologist, mm -hmm. that all of a sudden I've got to know more uh, about how to, I mean, I, I may know more in terms of the theory, but I don't know any more in terms of my relationship to this type of thing called trading. Yes. And because of that arrogance, it, it blinded me mm -hmm. to many of the issues that I had. And, mm -hmm. and until I began to accept, I had to accept that, that that was all bogus it was bullshit yeah and then and man up so to speak uh but for the women out there so you know woman up either way but i'm not trying to be sexist about it but the thing is that i had to have that uh, moment of come to jesus type of uh mm. of confrontation and then break through that mm. and once i did that i began to get better and not that i became a much better trader yeah uh, overall but I did, but I became a much better, uh, I, I, I increased my ability to focus much better. Right. And therefore started to change my trajectory hmm. uh, and do and follow through and do what was important for me to do. So, and that was to uh, increase my self-discipline hmm. and to see things from a standpoint of clarity hmm. rather than muddled by uh the, 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 the uh, shadow of myself getting in the way. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, I, I, I would, what I hear you saying there is that possibly without having that personal struggle and having to work that out and have a victory in a sense, then maybe your work with traders and, you know, when we were working together um, would be less kind of defined and less, less powerful. I think it's a great point, and I certainly agree with it because it gave me a point of ref not only of reference it gave me a point of looking at the situation from their standpoint as well so i, I know what at least what yeah. i went through and if they went through as much and probably in some cases maybe even more mm. uh but certainly the level of pain mm. was similar and that's why that book is full of techniques and tools mm. and Looking back on it, I still feel that that was important uh, mm. because we've. In, in, when you go into battle, you got to have your weapons. Mm -hmm. Whether it's a battle of wits or a battle of of, uh, of uh, devices. Yeah. And the thing is, if you don't, then you run a big, a, a huge risk of not being effective mm. and of losing. Mm. So that's why that book is full of tools. Mm -hmm. But uh, now, and it's just, that's a both end. It's a both end. The tools yeah. are great. We need them. And as well, we've got to start off with a good uh, uh, framework, a good conceptualization of what we're about to do, and then begin to build on that from, mm -hmm. from a, a good sturdy foundation. Mm, perfect. Hey, Woody, I know that, um, I know you had some surgery this year and that was kind of, interruptive because I know before then you were a buff man in the gym regularly and really respecting not just not just the ability of our mind to guide our to guide our life but the importance of the body and the discipline of that can you talk a little bit about that and how physical fitness is so integral 
and committing to yourself in that way and how that benefits the rest of the body, benefits the mind and whatever we're doing day to day? That's such a great question, uh, David, because one of the first reasons that comes to mind is because it's shown through study after study after study, documented so well in, um, in neuroscience and hmm. uh, health and men's health and women's health and uh, uh, psychological uh, issues and psychiatric issues and where people are battling depression, things like that. And the point is, is that when we exercise, the studies show that there is a plethora, uh, just a, 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 a huge benefit to every aspect of our being. Mm. That means mind, body, spirit, and it supports uh, brain health, it supports clarity, it supports coherence, it supports the communication of your of your different brain parts in terms of the neuroscience of it. It supports uh, healthy immune responses. Of mm. course, during this pandemic, that's 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 even more mm. important. Uh, it supports um, our uh, the biodiversity in terms of uh, well, it, exercise may not support as much. Well, I think it does support about diversity, but more to the point that I'm making is that it supports the organs, the internal your internal, your gut, and, mm. and everything else to work better. Mm -hmm. So you're, you're actually creating uh, a strong laser precision focus. Mm. At the same time, you are creating the capacity mm -hmm. for uh, the development of a, an emotional and uh, uh, physical and physiological uh, response to what you're dealing with. Yeah. And you're just creating an overall better environment, uh, an emotional environment, a mental environment, a physical environment, and a physiological environment that are all uh, pointing in the same direction and going for the same goal. Gotcha. So, mm -hmm. I mean, the, the, the positive uh, ep, uh, effects of, uh, of exercise cannot be overstated. I no. could talk, or and you could talk, and others could talk for days and not and go over the same material again, yeah. but so many of the beautiful uh, and wonderful uh, effects that uh, exercise has on our body. Mm -hmm. It's interesting. We, we had, I, I, I'm committed every, every day I'm doing something. Uh, six days a week I'm intensely doing my program and I, get, I cut myself a bit of slack one day, but sometimes the argument or the discussion comes up with other people I meet and they say, oh, man, you're a bit, you know, you're a bit kind of, you're either extreme or you're sort of a bit over the top with it. And I kind of, what, what you're talking about there is there's no negative benefits. You know, we can't say enough good about it. But I just thought as you were talking, I was thinking, you know, what's bad? Tell me the things that, uh, that are bad about exercise. There is nothing bad about it. It's all good. It's just layers of well, that's that now, now, there is one caveat. Okay. That you can, like anything else, any, even things that are really good for you. Right. Uh, first is water. You know, if without water, we will die. Right. Water is an elixir to our system. I mean, it yeah. it, it promotes uh, self communication, all that stuff that you know that, and I, I'm sure you, your listeners know yeah. that it supports. But if you drink too much water, mm. you can you can literally kill yourself mm -hmm. because you're breaking down your cell walls. They, they lose their ability to conduct the mm. electricity and to communicate with one another. Mm -hmm. So it's not that there's nothing. I mean, it's not that there's something inherently bad about mm -hmm. exercise. It's just that you can't overdo it. So right. when you go and exercise, you don't want to go in and, as a weekend warrior and every weekend you're going to bust your ass and then yeah. do nothing for a week. Right. Uh, but to your point, though, I think you made a good point that uh, just everything associated with, with exercise is great. We just have to go into it with a mindset yeah. that, we're in it for the long haul. Yes, yes. And, and, and do things in a, in a prudent way. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think anything in an extreme sense uh, normally comes right. back to a mentality of some sort. It comes back from a sense of lack. It comes uh, trying to prove oneself rather than just being uh, accepting that we are enough as we are, where we are. Exactly, exactly. Yeah.
Um, yeah, well, that's um, – I want to talk to you about resilience because, you know, <clears throat> I think resilience is such an amazing quality to, to, to focus on developing. And it's one of the things that I think if, if people have been being or um, displaying a resilience has really served them well this year, and if it hasn't, it's really been – this year's been extremely difficult. Um, in so many ways, 2020 we're talking about. Um, can, can you, uh, you know, speak a little bit about resilience and the, how you've seen that playing out from both sides this year with the stresses of COVID-19, but also how resilience really just makes a, um, you know, really contributes to a person's robustness and ability to live life on their own terms? Absolutely. In fact, I, I apologize. I can't remember the author's name right now, but I'll give him a plug anyway with the name of his book. It's called Resilience, mm. <laughs> oddly enough. And uh, he did a great job with this concept. And the way he approached it was that he had, as we are now, he had but, but over a year conversations with his uh, military buddy. He was a uh, special forces. I believe he was a SEAL, mm -hmm. Navy SEAL, which, of course, is a, uh, it's an arduous training that many, many, many fall out of. Uh, and they uh, produce an elite uh, mind, body, spirit fighting uh, machine, actually, mm -hmm. but, but with uh, the sensitivity in there as well. And, that's, but, and that gets me right to the point of talking about resilience. Resilience is that quality. Uh, well, I guess I didn't finish that point with, with him. So he had conversations with his, uh, I believe it was a SEAL buddy mm. that he'd gone through deployments with and had been in, in life or death situations over and over and over again. Mm. So they came to this conversation from a very deep and a very abiding and uh, a very well-connected standpoint where they could have really intimate conversations. Mm. And some of the things that came out were things that uh, about having the ability to look at oneself truly, mm. uh, to see, like uh, Clint Eastwood said in one of his movies, a man's got to know his limitations. Mm. Uh, and have that whole understanding of awareness about ourselves as we mm. are going through something that's difficult. And the realization that, uh, although it's a cliche, but there's some semblance of, of real truth to it. That is that those things that don't, kill us, make us strong. Mm. So it's the point that we approach life from a standpoint of balance, mm. that yes, we may have screwed up. In fact, we may say we fucked up, mm. but we're not, we're not. There's a very huge difference between looking at something that you did and saying that was bad, that was really stupid, because all of us do something from sure. time to time that's really mm. stupid. But we are not stupid, mm -hmm. and it's looking at looking at yourself with compassion. Mm -hmm. That's another big point of resiliency in, in my mind. Mm -hmm. uh, looking at yourself, and not from compassion from a standpoint that that's not uh, comply. Uh, uh, that's not giving in. Mm -hmm. uh, that's not saying that uh, you're condoning that type of behavior. You're mm -hmm. saying that, given the situation, I understand. You had your reasons for doing this. It may, mm -hmm. it may be a conversation with yourself, but in the, in, in as much as things happen to that, you found yourself in that situation. Mm -hmm. Now, what do we need to do? And and, and it's okay as we you know because we have a, a modification of parts in ourselves mm -hmm. to speak to all of those parts and saying that now um, it's an opportunity for me to grow, for me to use this as a way to get better. And in the next instance where I meet something of these types of situations that uh, I'm going to affirm that I'm going to do better, but I'm going to also give myself the tools and the knowledge that maybe I didn't have before. Mm. From hindsight, I've realized that, that these are things I need to incorporate and learn and, and uh, begin to uh, Develop so that next time I'm I'm better. So resilience is that ability to when you use the word robust, robust a moment ago. I think that's a great term to use mm. with regard to resilience. 
because we want to face it from a standpoint of being uh, ready, of mm-hmm. being strong, of having the ability to bounce back uh, and, and and put those dots. And, you know, I often talk about, uh, share with people that you got to uh, connect the dots. Mm-hmm. But if you don't have the dots and the dots are connected, I mean, the dots are created through work, through uh uh, study mm. through uh, giving you opportunities to sit down and and think uh, introspectively and uh, in a in a self um, examination way, mm-hmm. so that you begin to incorporate those dots, and then in the next situation, you've got more of those dots to connect. Mm-hmm. But as as we're talking about this, it brings all to its mind that it's it's it's. Uh, it's like a gestalt. That's, and that was a German word that was brought uh, through. Uh, uh, well, it's, it's a, an approach to working with someone where you look at the big picture, look at mm-hmm. and it, and it, and it, and it kind of means everything. Um, so as we look at resilience through the lens of who we are, where we're going, and how we're going to get there, and what do we need in order for, to get us there, mm-hmm. those answers will also include the things necessary for resilience as well. Mm. Mm-hmm. Um, Woody, with regard to um, the, you're talking about connecting the dots, <clears throat> I'd love to hear your perspective on um, the way in which you've, you know, you've dealt with a number of different professionals, helping them to uh, put tools together and, and work out things which enable them to be better in their profession. And and specifically talking about trading, because that's where we met, and that's your – would you say that that's your niche in working with traders? Well, it's certainly uh, – well, I also have a clinical practice. Right, yes. But uh, working with traders is a big part of what I do. And, mm. and yes, it is a niche. Yes, do, exactly. so do you think more than maybe other professions that trading is – you know, it really shows up if you haven't got your understanding about yourself and – uh, your mind right is it does it show up more in that field without question without question uh, because it's an extremely challenging uh, endeavor it um, it forces well everything about yourself that is a little bit um, afraid at the ends mm-hmm. uh, if you are particularly stressed if you're distracted if you are if you have a lot of baggage, that you that that one and, and all of us do all of us do. Mm. It's important to become aware. Mm. It's important to do that self eva- uh, evaluation. Mm. Uh, but unfortunately, a lot of folks, a when they get into trading, don't realize mm. the 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 extent that trading will challenge you mm. because they don't know it yet. They're just getting into it. Mm-hmm. And when you couple with that the fact that a lot of folks are living their lives uh, uh, walking the walking asleep. Mm-hmm. You know? They're they're a, as if they were walking around a dream. Yeah, and, and they don't. They, they it's they're living an unexamined life. Right. Now that's not everyone, but a lot yeah. of folks. Mm-hmm. But even for those who are living an examined life, it's still important to begin to bring to bear on the trading mm-hmm. those. Uh, things, those strengths, those uh, ability to help you focus mm-hmm. that are needed in, in the uh, the trading process. Mm-hmm. So there's a lot of, of parts. There's a lot of moving parts. And if someone goes into it, and let's say some of the parts they've got some insight in, others they don't, that's going to show up. Mm-hmm. The, the 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 markets because of fear and greed having mm-hmm. to do with money mm-hmm. and what that means is that not only is 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 money uh, something that we all have very deep beliefs about, mm. that some of which are uh, we're unaware of. It's also the part of the trading process that mm. gets us into trouble so quickly, because when we're in a trade, unlike any other business, mm. with every tick of the market that we're in that trade, we're either winning, gaining. Mm-hmm. Are losing mm-hmm. 
And those bring up all types. Well, they, they, they activate all of these underlying belief systems about mm-hmm. themselves. And even if we are fairly adjusted, that we're fairly mm. uh, will include things that we're not adjusted in because mm. that's the whole notion of being fairly. You know, it's, it's not encompassing. Mm. So we're going to have challenges. Mm. We're going to be challenged. Mm. If we have in a sense that what those challenges are, then we can begin to uh, use that kind of prophylactically uh, in a way that helps us to get ready for those challenges. Mm-hmm. You know, uh, to anticipate them before they, they come up yeah. and begin to work through them. So this whole idea of um, trading being one of the most difficult things that we could do. Mm-hmm. In fact, I've always often said it's, it's, it's swimming in shark infested waters. Mm-hmm. Because if, if you don't have yourself together, mm-hmm. when you, 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 you're more than likely going to come against someone possibly who does, who's a mm-hmm. very good trader. Mm-hmm. And what I've always said is they will stick their bony fingers in the, in the pockets of your jeans and pull out wads of cash. <laughs> uh, and that's, for those, what is happening, it's, it's, that's a very demoralizing uh, situation. You know? yeah. But it, it just speaks to the, the, the fact that we've got to prepare ourselves mm. mentally, emotionally, and spiritually to enter into the arena. Yeah. And if we aren't, then somebody's going to eat our lunch. Yeah. Yeah, I heard um, a, a very influential trader and uh, educator in my life and also yours, um, Sam Sidon, talking last week about, um, he said, you know, people always come, and Sam's been in the game for a long time and has, has a great knowledge of, um, of the way to trade the markets and a lot of experience with people coming to him saying, you know, I've been successful, Sam, I've done all these things, and Sam's looking thinking, wow, this guy's really done a lot. And then they, they just say, but I just can't, I just never thought this would be so difficult. And these are people with, exactly. you know, intellectually, practically achieved a lot, and they've come and said, "This trading game is so, so tough." And uh, I resonate with that. I see that it really does challenge every fiber. But I'd like to ask you this: one of the things that Sam talks about a lot is, I'm hopefully going to be interviewing Sam coming up on the show. But he talks about set and forget trading. So I'm just wondering, with that, you know, when you're looking at a trade, and as you say, every trade is a is a um, negotiation between sellers and buyers. And, the, and so, therefore, the price can move sideways. However, it's generally going up and down in, in small increments. So that you're losing, you know, you're making more money or you're making less money um, or maybe you're, you're actually behind where you started. But there's a movement up and down consistently. And as you're watching it, that can be very stressful. But one of the things Sam talks about is a set and forget trade. So I'm wondering whether once, does that help the mentality and, and kind of de-emotionalise the experience when, if you're skilled to be able to set and forget trades? You know, Sam's a, a great example of, of that and a um, great guy, uh, great trader. And that is a, a wonderful uh, use of detachment. Mm. And it's a way to begin to talk about arming yourself and being ready for the arena. Mm. Um, it's a way to Get yourself prepared. Do what you need to do. Get your analysis in order. Mm. And when you enter the trade, have everything bracketed so that it, it and depending upon the uh, trade platform that you use, I, I, I'm, not, I'm not familiar with, not, I'm certainly not familiar with all of them, but if, if there's those that I am familiar with, all of them have ways to uh, identify certain types of parts of the trade where you need to, like a decision tree. Mm-hmm. And in that decision tree, um, you put in certain orders, uh, order sends order, orders cancel order, things like that. Mm. So that's what a bracket trade is. Mm. And with a bracket trade, you've got everything taken care of. You mm. know, the, the entries, targets, stops, and exits, right. which are the four essential things of a trade. Yeah. So that once you enter into that, you don't have to sit there and watch it. Mm. Because that's part of the issue. Uh, as we, It's like watching a train wreck or mm. maybe even watching... Uh, something that's even great happening. Yeah. You may be, because we can just be, we can be just as overwhelmed by things that are positive as we can by things that are, are negative. Uh, and as that, as that's happening, when we, when we become distracted by those things that we see and we interpret them, mm. then it sets off all kinds of uh, alarm bells, even if it's good, 
And, oh, wow, this is great. I, I need to bring and put in more size. Well, that would not be prudent probably because you're increasing your risk and, and you're getting out of risk management. Yes. So mm-hmm. part of the point is that when we provide ourselves with an opportunity to decrease the times when we are activated mm. uh, negatively, right. it could be a positive situation, but we're activated negatively. Mm-hmm. Then when we decrease those opportunities, right. then we're going to increase our ability to have the trade follow the plan. Because right. we always say that we want to plan the trade, trade the plan, mm-hmm. follow all of our rules, keep all of our commitments. Mm-hmm. And it's much more easy to do that when you don't have the stuff right in front of you. Right. So that's a great tactic. Uh, and but but here's a, a caveat again that you've got to let that tactic do what it can do. Mm. By when you forget it, you really have to let it go. Right. You got to you know you can't keep it open, keep coming back and, mm-hmm. and, and look at it. Oh, let me check on it again because mm-hmm. that's that. Then you're violating. Some aspect of the check, set and forget uh, um, uh, rubric and the, mm-hmm. and the uh, scaffolding. Right? Mm-hmm. So, but that being said, yeah, I think it's a great way to approach it, and it certainly can reduce the amount of uh, of hemorrhaging, mm-hmm. which, which often happens when you're sitting there staring at the screen, right? Because mm-hmm. it causes know. you to do things that you shouldn't be doing. Don't yes. I'm yeah, not. I'm, I'm not sure, Woody. If you, I know you work with a lot of um, private individual traders, um, but whether you've worked with any professional institutional traders. But I think that it, it appears to me that those who are notably professionals, as in that's that they, they're working for Goldman Sachs, for example, or one of the major banks, and they're in their trading. It would seem to me that that's uh, a person who has really looking at that as a professional. Um, uh, you know, set of, um, you know, he's going to work, he's going to his job. And a lot of individual traders who maybe work, they're, maybe they're trying to build up their trading to work uh, completely as a trader, earn their profession from trading, or maybe they're doing this as a side hustle. Maybe they've got other things that, that are going on. But would it be true to say that um, the the that there is a distinction in the way in which professional traders um, approach their Thing is, it is it something also to do with maybe they haven't they're not trading their own money they're trading the bank's money and that has a difference to the way that they approach the trading well okay let's break that down yes there are different ways to approach absolutely uh totally agree with that and there's going to be a huge disparity between someone who's a professional uh trader mm. that's trading in uh goldman sachs for instance Mm. or Wells Fargo or whoever they're trading with for. And someone who's a professional trader that's trading, they're professional, but they're trading their own account. Mm-hmm. But still, the common uh, thread, in my view, between those two professionals is the word profession. Mm-hmm. They have discipline. Mm-hmm. They have, uh, through constructing consistency mm-hmm. in how they do what they do. In other words, calculating and analyzing uh, using the mechanical data, dealing with all the mechanics of the trade with mm-hmm. regard to their um, keeping their emotions managed mm-hmm. uh, using emotional intelligence. Mm-hmm. Uh, they are approaching it from a much more systematic, a much more uh, um, uh, uh, coherent way mm-hmm. than folks who are approaching it from a uh, somewhat uh, scattered, erratic form mm-hmm. because they are they haven't developed that discipline. They haven't developed that. They haven't put those dots in to connect those dots yet. Yeah. So the professional has, mm-hmm. and their discipline. And uh, in, 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 in the, the, the professionals that I know and, and have been around for years, they are much more uh, immersed in having a sense of foundation. Mm. They have a sense of clarity about where they're going. They have a sense of what they need to bring to the arena. Mm. And they practice uh, not only uh, the tenets of good training, but they practice the tenets of good planning and good follow-through mm. the development of, of, mm. uh, of their perspective. So that's the real difference between professionals and those who aren't. Mm. It's that they have a real strong sense of that. 
not only what they uh, they're about, but a strong sense of uh, focus on what matters most. Mm-hmm. And I think that one of the other points I wanted to talk to you about was the importance of a trading plan, because it would seem to me that it would be inconceivable to think that Goldman Sachs, for example, dealing with million, you know, millions, tens of millions, maybe hundreds of millions of dollars in the market at any one point in time of their own money, but also of their clients' money, that they wouldn't have a strict plan that's absolutely set. Um, I know we've seen radical moves by some traders that have really brought down some financial and, and investment banks around the world. But generally, the ones who have survived, particularly ones like Goldman that have done consistently well every year, um, they would have a very, uh, you know, everything would be paired away. And it's those traders of uh, executing on a, on a general plan, most probably, and then all maybe putting their own uh, flavour of, of their own rules to uh, a greater plan. But the, the, the the place of a plan is just so critical, isn't it? You know, it, it can't be overstated, David. Mm. It's it's absolutely imperative. And it's not about having a Goldman Sachs plan. Mm. I mean, there's a, because they're dealing with such large amounts of money and, and such a large uh, uh, number of, of, uh, of uh, variables that mm-hmm. the normal, even the normal professional is going to deal with, but say mm-hmm. the normal. Uh, a retail trader like you, you and I mm. uh, wouldn't be able to deal with. But still, it doesn't have to be a plan like that, but have a plan that you have faith in because you back test it. Mm-hmm. Right. You have a strategy that you that you are confident about. And mm-hmm. confidence comes from practicing it, using sim trading, things like mm-hmm. that. But as you approach it, it's one of the most important things that I could impart to new traders that may be listening out there. Mm is that what, whatever that, that plan is, work that plan. Mm-hmm. Don't change the plan mm-hmm. like, this, like the old cliche goes. Don't change horses in the middle of the stream. Mm-hmm. You don't want to change the plan prematurely. Mm-hmm. And you don't want to change, uh, change the plan as you are into the plan. Mm-hmm. Let, the, let, let that plan work out. Get information from that plan. Mm-hmm. And, and let the markets prove you wrong or right. Mm-hmm. Uh, if and if they do, and, and they, they will prove one or the other, mm-hmm. then that's going to provide you additional data. Yeah. And then and, and, and that's another part that can't be over, uh, overemphasized. Mm-hmm. That the data, the information that comes out of your working through a trade, mm-hmm. both the mechanical data, which I said before, is everything has to do with mechanics of the trade and the internal data. Going on, what's going on in your heart and your, and your head. Both those types of information are extremely important. They're both equally important. And as we move through the trade, we're going to find out things about both the mechanics and about ourselves mm. that we need to document. Mm-hmm. So when we talk about plan, all those other things are involved as well. Mm. But let that plan give you as much information as you can while you are using it. Right. If you want to use that plan once and then change it after you after it's done, mm-hmm. then change it based upon analysis, based upon mm-hmm. uh, a, a a way of looking at it that is informed, informed yeah. from the information, informed from the other data, that the other variables. Uh, but you don't want to change it out of emotional response. Mm-hmm. So let that plan work or not. Get the mm-hmm. information from it, and then tweak it as you go go down the line. Yep. So that, that's that's yep. it, it, planning is just it, it, it's essential. Mm. The um the my my understanding is, and this is what I'm doing is I have a, a plan that's documented and clear. I have to exercise discipline to then get feedback, and then I can make my tweaks after you know after you've you've done a number of trades, 20, 30 trades, whatever it is you, you think is enough feedback. To then say, well, is this working? Could I tweak it here? Then I'm back test that. Okay, that's going to work better than what I'm currently doing. I'm going to formally change my plan. And the next trade is it's applying that same discipline because it's only when we apply the discipline to something that's not moving that we can get accurate feedback. And then from that and doing the analysis, we can then actually make adjustments. That's what it comes. You know, to. that's so well said, David. Yeah, that's so well said. Because and let me focus on one of the things that you just shared: feedback. And that's, of course, is what we talked about a moment ago with the data, the information. Mm. 
But here's a real important point as well about feedback. Feedback is always in the system, Mm -hmm. but it won't always help you if you are paying attention, Mm -hmm. if you are focused on getting that feedback, if you are ready to accept whatever that feedback is, like a good researcher. A good researcher never goes into the research with the data that they want to have. Mm. They go into looking at what is going to happen. They're curious about their... Sure, they would love it if the hypothesis came true Mm -hmm. and they became Nobel Prize winners and all that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. But they, a good researcher is looking for facts. They're looking Mm -hmm. for real, accurate data. Mm -hmm. Because if the data is not accurate, it's not good data. If it's not good data, then it's a waste of time. It's a waste of time. Mm -hmm. Then it's going to... You're going to end up in places that you don't want to be. Yeah. So this notion of feedback, but also paying attention and being aware that you are, you want to be in a mindset that is accepting of whatever comes mm. and then incorporate that into the mix of your uh, calculations, then that's what's going to set you on a, a road, a much clearer road to getting, going from where you are now, where mm. you want to be. Where you want to be is consistently successful trade. Someone who uh, is taking the losses when they come, but they're always small, mm. never huge. Because if we have a big loss, then we have done something uh, wrong. But the, but the point of feedback is to help to reduce those losses by managing your risk mm-hmm. and having a coherent strategy that you're following. And as, as you said a moment ago, until it doesn't. St- the work in it and it may not fall apart it may not implode mm-hmm. and if it does it's okay yeah but a lot of times it's just minor tweaks along the way but you make those tweaks that are informed mm-hmm. they're not tweaks they're not emotional tweaks they're informed tweaks that are based on the research based upon your feedback based upon your process and the uh types of outcomes that you got right mm. Yeah, I must say, building the training plan for me has been an elusive thing that's been just so hard to – it's been such a such a big thing, but I, I've, I'm comfortable now with the plan I've got, and I've been doing some, um, you know, in another trading group uh, of uh, where we've been uh, – we have a coach over us, and the discipline and the accountability there has been tr- tremendous. And also the, come on, chop, 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 let's get on with it. Let's not um, – so there's a, the, the element where we've got to sort ourselves out, we've got to be right, we've got to approach it, we've got to understand where we're coming from. But then it's about practice, 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 and have something definite to work against or work with. Absolutely, absolutely. You know, uh, a lot of folks kind of poo poo uh, sim trading, otherwise yeah. known as paper trading, demo trading, mm-hmm. because they say that there's no skin in the game. Mm-hmm. Well, think about when you first learn how to play. What's your favorite board game? If you have one, board game for me, uh, probably Monopoly. Monopoly, okay. Now, when you play Monopoly, when you first learn how to play, did you say, oh, I don't, I don't want to win. I just want to just have fun playing. Did you ever say that? Probably, yeah, yeah. starts off that way. For the first no, moment. really. Did you, did you say you actually said that? Well, um, what did I do? No, did, or did you say so? Or, or, or did you say something like, I want to win? Yeah, I there's probably. Win this game. Pro- the, 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 the I, I know what I said. The time between the start and then quickly moving to, I want to beat these Buggers sitting around the table. Yeah, sure. exactly, exactly. And emotional skin is just as strong right. because eventually emotion is going to come into play anyway mm. as the, the skin of money because money has to do with emotions as well. Mm. We just talked about it not too long ago. Now, if that's the case, then it's not really about the money. It's mm. about your sense of self and you, every time you do something you're putting it on the line mm-hmm. even if nobody else is watching you're watching and all of those parts that we talked about that are in your head right. you're watching too mm-hmm. so it's it critically important to keep a grasp mm. of what you're doing and how you're doing it. yeah so when we talk about this notion of uh, dealing with the with the mental part mm. And the emotional part, knowing that the sim trading, first of all, it's not a game. Mm. So you don't want to view it as a video game. You Mm -hmm. want to view it as an actual trade. 
mm-hmm. because you want to do everything in that at that time that you would do if you had money in the lot. Yeah. Otherwise, it it, it becomes just uh, an, another exercise. Mm-hmm. The power is in doing it as if it were under game situation. Mm-hmm. Right. So when you 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 practice anything like you do, well, the point I'm making is you do everything like you do anything. Mm-hmm. So if you're doing something that you relegated to just you know, it doesn't matter. You know, it's just it, it's just it's just a. I'm not going to lose any money. Yeah. Then and you play that trade in that mindset. Then mm-hmm. then what's going to happen when you get into a real trade, real money? You're going to do the right. same thing because you have practiced through that way of looking at things. You practice through that, that mm-hmm. mindset. Mm-hmm. So the power in sim is the power that's attributed from doing it as though you were it was under. Uh, real game conditions. Now, we start talking about sim with regard to uh, follow through. I mm-hmm. believe that's what we got. How we got there, mm-hmm. and doing what's in your best interest. Mm-hmm. So, it 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 really just boils down to understanding that, like brain surgery or mm-hmm. like doing a good job of cleaning the kitchen. Mm-hmm. Both of them involve attention to detail. Both mm-hmm. of them. Both of them involve being in the now, being mm-hmm. fully available, fully present, and in the now of the trade. Mm-hmm. Meaning that once you start that process, you are doing it under the uh, under the uh, the the development mm-hmm. of all of your senses, all of your tools, bringing everything to bear on what you're doing, and doing it in a way that is um, mindful, and doing it in a way that gets you putting everything into it. Mm-hmm. And as you do that, then you're going to construct consistency in doing the right things habitually so that eventually you're going to develop the capacity for emotional strength and endurance, which is mm. really what we're talking about at the bottom, mm. at the bottom line. Mm. Um, Woody, do you think that as, as people become better traders, as a result of becoming better thinkers and, and also accepting of themselves in all their vulnerabilities and strengths and those things, does, have you found that that, um, or it helps be, us become a more well-rounded person, a more robust person, uh, resilient, as we said before. But did, have you seen that there's been transformations in people as they've got really got their act together and that's pro, um, benefited their trading, that their life has actually gotten better as well? Absolutely. Um, it has to, uh, as I look at it, uh, David, it has a lot to do with um, not only the aspect of awareness, mm. we talked about that a couple of times already, because you can't change what you can't face and you can't face what you don't know. Right. But here's another way of looking at that. As we move through things that are challenging, mm. we're going to learn more about ourselves. Mm-hmm. Now, it's not just about what we do in that situation, mm. because that's how we learn as right. human beings. Mm-hmm. We generalize this particular situation to, mm. to everything else that we're doing. Okay. Now, in some cases, that works against us, as in post-traumatic stress disorder and things like that. When we when we're right. dealing with something that has rocked our world, mm. and say it was child abuse or something unfortunate like that, mm. then and we generalize that the world is this way. Well, it's the same principle, but it works both ways. Both on the one side of the equation is the other. So we it's too it's, it's unfortunate that. Uh, that often is the case for folks that have gone through a lot of of, um, of hurt and pain. But the good thing is that we still can generalize the positive aspects of even those difficult situations because we talk about resiliency, we talk about robustness, we talked about bouncing back, we talked about um, learning from things that that were very painful but that didn't kill you. Mm-hmm then we can move through this and we can do it in other aspects of our lives as well. I've done right. it before. I can do it again. I, I, I weathered that storm. What could be so much different about this one? And as we get more, as we gain more information about ourselves, we gain more information about life, mm-hmm. putting those and all those variables together. Then we are continuously uh, forging up our foundation of who mm-hmm. we are. So, yes, absolutely, that our lives, in my view, as we work in one area, 
of that has to do with our uh, emotional management, has to do with our self-regulation, has to do with our, our abilities to not only accept what, what's going on at the time, but yeah. then use that to learn from it and then move on. Mm-hmm. We're going to grow, and as we grow, we're going to get better and better. And mm-hmm. before you know it, um, you know, we've reached another milestone. And you know, it brings me to another, you talked about planning before. You know, planning is something that is so uh, fundamentally uh, critical mm. to everything that we do. But we don't, often, we don't use planning process as mm. though it were as important to everything that we do. And we run into things without a true coherent plan, without a plan that really makes sense because we thought it through. We just kind of put it together real quickly. And then we're off to the race. Mm-hmm. Well, that can have really deleterious consequences a lot of times mm-hmm. because you get you run into unanticipated situations, and they throw you off your game. And then before you know it, you're distracted, and then you become anxious, and the, mm-hmm. the anxiety begins to uh, increase the distraction. And before you know it, you're confused, and you're you're screwing up again. Well, that could be truncated to a, to a degree once you start in the process mm-hmm. by going through the planning process logically, going through it meticulously, going through it with both the, the boots on the ground and the 35,000 foot level together because mm-hmm. each perspective is going to provide you with different levels of information. Mm-hmm. But we need both, mm-hmm. both the big picture and the detail. Right. And, even, and of course, we know the devil's in the detail. Yeah. And that's how we can lose track of things that we didn't anticipate because we didn't have a good level of detail. Mm. We, or we can miss the big, uh, big picture if we don't, you know, if, we, if we're so caught up in detail that we don't see the forest from the trees. Mm-hmm. So the planning is absolutely not just an essential process, but it, but it is something that you need to approach it mm. with the level of appreciation mm. for what it can do for you, but also what the lack of it can do mm. against you as well. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Hey, Woody, I'd like to ask you, um, in the introduction, I mentioned that, um, uh, yeah, just read through a, a, a spiel which um, you helped me with, which was you were talking about the Center, uh, the Center for Peak Performance 2000 uh, incorporates the latest neuroscientific technologies of transformation change and internal balancing. Now, internal balancing, I know that in the meditation work that um, I did with you and, and you, I, I take it that you use as part of your work, you're using binaural beats. Um, so can you talk a little bit about the place of meditation generally and getting as a tool for being present and also some of these technologies which are available now and have been for some time, but binaural beats is one of them. Maybe there's other things you want to mention that all go into a person really honing their skills and becoming a peak performer? Well, it gets us to, first of all, and that's such a, a great question. It gets us to um, the fact that our knowledge level is exponentially expanding and, and just exploding, actually. Yeah. The number of new studies in mindfulness, mm. just mindfulness alone, I mean, meditation is a huge area and that has been going on uh, in terms of research for mm-hmm. at least 30 years. Mm-hmm. But now with so many people uh, accepting the positive aspects of mindfulness mm. that we're getting even more information. Mm. And what that, what that does, it, it forms us how powerful mindfulness is. Mm. Um, let, me, let me speak from mindfulness just for a moment. You know, when we're mindful, it really, we talked a little bit about the brain's ability to uh, communicate with itself, Mm -hmm. the different parts of the brain, and to have a coherent plan. But the brain has to be coherent as well. Mm -hmm. If the brain is, um, the brain doesn't like confusion. It doesn't like things that uh, are not neatly Mm -hmm. um, uh, organized. Mm -hmm. And it, uh, it tends to promote and uh, place value on mm. 
and pay attention to things that are diverse, things that are complex, things that are um, very uh, uh, intellectually engaging mm. because it likes learning. It loves learning mm -hmm. because learning also equates to survival. Mm. And the brain is about everything with regard to survival. Mm -hmm. So when we look neuroscientifically at things that we've been learning about mindfulness, mm. we are be, begin to see that it helps this sense of coherency. It helps the sense of clarity. It helps the sense of communication, of mm. coordination. And when you, when the brain is communicating with itself, and communi and and is coherent in how it approaches uh, new challenges, mm. then and with clarity, that's also called integration. Mm. Now, what mindfulness will necessarily begin to promote is that ability to integrate, for the mm. brain to be integrated. Mm. And if uh, I may, I'll provide a, a little bit of a metaphor. When you, you like music, right, Dave? I do. And then. Of, of course you do. You like, <laughs> you love music. We, we all love music. Now, let's say you wanted to uh, see a symphony orchestra. Yeah. And you walk in and they're warming up. Does it sound like harmony? No, no of course not. No. It's cacophonous. It's, 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 it's all over the place. Yeah, exactly. But you know that that's part of the process. Uh -huh. Then the conductor comes out. And let's say uh, she or he, you know, taps their baton on the bed. Mm -hmm. Everything goes quiet. And then they lift their arms up and start to conduct this beautiful piece of music mm -hmm. and, and get this, this harmony that comes out. Mm -hmm. Now, they're, they're on the one hand, everyone's playing off the same page. On the other hand, they aren't mm -hmm. because everybody, well, let's put it this way, all the different sections, you have the woodwinds, the, the, the uh, brass, the, 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 the strings, you know, the mm -hmm. drum, mm -hmm. all of them have different music that they're looking at but it's all a part of that same piece right so that is integrated it is integrated now before there was chaos and now there's communication before mm. there was disharmony now there's harmony mm. that's what happens in our brains now there's another aspect that goes along with it uh, with uh with um integration is differentiation mm. and differentiation is what happens when you we look at the first versus the second versus the third chair of each section. Now, the first chair is ostensibly the person who is the best. And usually that person has put in their uh, 10,000 hours in or maybe 20,000, whatever, to become a virtuoso. Mm. Maybe the one sitting next to them has put in maybe 15,000. Mm. The third has put in 10,000. I mean, you know, these are arbitrary numbers. Yeah. But the point is, is that each of them has their own path that took them to becoming good enough to be in the symphony orchestra and good enough to be in that seat. That's individuation uh -huh. and differentiation. Yeah. yeah. Differentiation is the part of your brain that gets enough nutrients, that gets enough dopamine, it gets enough other neurotransmitters and the mm. serotonin that it is operating well mm. so that it can add coherency to the, well, it can add of positive aspects of the conversation that create coherence. Mm -hmm. Coherency is one things when we have safe, say, say for instance, uh, you and I, maybe four of the people were having a conversation. All of us come from different backgrounds, mm -hmm. different parts of the planet, but say we all have a certain level of understanding of trade. Mm -hmm. So that our conversations, although coming from diverse backgrounds, mm -hmm. which could add to the differentiation, mm -hmm. is still coherent because we're all talking about the same thing right. from a from a different vantage point yes but 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 informed by the same process yeah That's so differentiation and integration mm -hmm. are what are promoted through mindfulness mm -hmm. mindfulness also helps with regard to relaxation and uh, creating and, and lowering stress managing stress levels if you manage stress levels then you're also going to increase the uh, immune response of the body. Mm. So mindfulness and, and all of these things are, are documented over years over the past uh, 10, 15 years, yeah. at least. We even go back further than that. But I'm talking about robust, very um, uh, well uh, formulated uh, studies mm. of, of the powers of mindfulness. 
Mm-hmm. So when you look at mindfulness and you look at one of the things that it promotes is to be in the now. We talked about that a few minutes mm-hmm. ago. That when you're doing something as uh, important and because it has to do with your, your capital and as challenging as trading, mm-hmm. then you want to do so with, uh, with all of your cylinders, so to speak, firing at the same, you know, uh, in the same time. Mm-hmm. You don't. Have, you don't have happy cylinders firing, and and you know it's not. <laughs> that's not going to do very good for you. So you want to be in the now. You don't want to be uh, distracted by what might happen or what did happen. Yeah. Uh, all that stuff. The only moment that matters is this. One. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And being in the, I would say, being in the now, of the trade is very important. Mm-hmm. What's going on right now, from right. moment to moment. Right. And as you practice mindfulness, it helps you to become more focused in that moment. Mm. Because if, if that moment comes and you're thinking about what might happen and you distract it, maybe only 30% of your decision-making power, maybe, maybe 90%, maybe you need all 100. It doesn't matter if, you, if you're focusing on something and you're only using uh, a less than the amount that you need at mm. that time. Mm-hmm. Then you're going to be deficient in what you bring to that moment. Yeah. And trading is difficult enough that it requires that that laser precision mm. in focus mm-hmm. that comes from being in the now of the trade, comes from being in a sense that all that I have at this moment right. is focused in this moment. Uh-huh. All that I have in me at this moment is focused in this moment. Mm. And that and that in and of itself is going to be more powerful. And all brought about by a practice. Well, it's a, it's it's not just mindfulness, but certainly mm-hmm. mindfulness will add a foundation to those efforts mm-hmm. that um, that are so important to the trading process. Mm-hmm. I love that so much, Woody. So much. I, did, did I answer your question? Enough? You've answered it in a in a wonderful uh, and you know touched the question was a bit all over the place, and you've nailed it. So thank you. You know, I love I love what you just said then about um, the presence and, and the moment because the, the being present to me is a beautiful truth. You know, that is truth at that point in time because there is no other moment that we have. There is no other life we have than what we have in this moment. And right now, as this is being recorded, I get this mo- this time to spend with you, and I'm so grateful for that. But really, the and I, I was saying this in a similar way to someone the other day. We were sitting there having a coffee and. I explained, I said, look, my view on this is that life is happening right now between us. It's not the, it's not the whatever happened in the past because that's not accurate anyway. If two people had seen whatever happened for me in the past, they would have reported it differently to me. So that's not truth at all because it's through a whole bunch of filters. And what I'm looking forward to in the, the future, and, and if I'm trying to control that, is not real anyway. But the moment we have is right at this moment. And I said to this guy, I said, now, heaven forbid, but we might both choke on our uh, biscuit that we're eating and both fall over, die. That's it. We've, we've had that. It's all over. Well, it's not going to happen. But the point is the only moment, the only life that we have is happening in this moment. And if we can get present, then there's great power in that, isn't there? It's not something to be afraid of. For many years, I think, Woody, I was afraid of really being quiet and, and quietening that chatter. It's taken a long time. And I, I still, it's one of my challenges every day is to get present. But in that is great power, isn't there? You know, that's so well said, David, so well said, because after, there is no after this moment. There, there is no. Mm. The, the, the moment is the only moment that, mm. that exists. That, therefore, that's why it's the only moment that matters. Mm-hmm. Because if when we run out of moments, then maybe it's our moments that have run out. Maybe everybody else is still living and we're gone. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, and that's a one what happens after that of course is, an, is another conversation yeah but that moment is it mm-hmm. that's everything mm-hmm. so absolutely as you just well said eloquently it is what is going on now mm-hmm. is the most important thing in your life mm-hmm. right now mm-hmm. now in the next moment we after we have moved on mm-hmm. i've got clients coming up you've got other very important things coming up in your day, mm. then those are other moments. But those are other moments. Yeah. But, and those moments haven't come yet. Yes. This is the moment 
that matters. So therefore, this is also the moment of truth. Yes. When you get in that trade and you've got to make a decision, you come to that point where you, you're either going to go to the left, fall off the cliff, mm -hmm. crash and burn, lose, mm -hmm. or you're going to go to the right, keep all of your wits about you, keep your discipline intact, keep your A game at the platform, do what's in your best interest and your highest and best interest and your highest and best um, mm -hmm. focus self. And that dichotomy is always there. Mm. Either we're going to go to the left, do what's in our best interest, or we're going to go to the right and screw up. Mm. Which which is it going to be? Yeah. And we always have, like you, you what did Yogi Bear say? When you come to a fork in the road, take it. Yeah. So, <laughs> yeah. So, so the point is that we always are at that fork in the road. We're, Mm. Even if it's just a small decision, you know, the, the, the most important parts of our lives are informed by the small things more so than the large things. Mm. It's the yeah. tiny stuff that we do every day, like making your bed when you get up in the morning, things like that. Um, they are all woven together in this tapestry that we call our life of that day. Mm -hmm. And if something big happens, that's great. But the big thing that happens, and it might have a fairly significant effect on our lives, but those things that really put the the tensile strength in the fabric are the small, small knots that we that we're, that we're tying in to make that fabric. Mm. How how robust they are. We talk about this term of robustness. Mm. How strong it is. And you know that pretty much sums up for me what it is to show up. Mm. And we don't want to just show up for the trade. We want to show up for life. We yeah. show up when we um, have time with our family. We show up when we have time with, with, our, with our friends, mm. when we, with, with our professional colleagues, mm. with people that we don't know, someone we just met. Yeah. How are we showing up? Who are we when we show up? Is the rep the part of us that is um, challenged and impaired, that wants to uh, beat on beat their chest all the time because they're overcompensating or thinking that they're not good enough? Or is the person that is saying, you know what? Um, I screwed up a few times uh, last time I got into the situation, but I'm going to do better now. I, I trust that because I have done the work and I'm going to continue to do the work. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And the, what's the work? The work is on our mental self, our emotional self, our physical self. Mm -hmm. And the work goes on until that that there's no more moments. Yeah, yeah. Beautifully said. Wonderfully said. Um, I'm reminded of Jim Carrey, the comedian, has a great speech uh, he does uh, at a graduation of a university. And he one of the things he, he summarises and he says, you know, the only moment that counts is this moment and whether we're making our decisions out of love or fear. And it's so powerful that I'm going to do a, a series on that coming up. But um, that, that's that's another conversation. But it's broadly still about where where are we when we're in this moment that's in just you know there's no doubt about that we all have a moment right now if we're still breathing and living but where are we coming from are we are we coming from a backload of noise and confusion and, and stress and problems of the past or are we able to beautifully just accept who we are with all our faults and turn up as we are knowing that we can go go to work and do better and be better but being happy with where we are as a result of everything that we've lived and thought and done, before, you know, it's brought us to this point. That's a, I think meditation for me is a, is a place of being able to, it's acceptance as well, isn't it? It's acceptance of me in all my frailties, um, imperfections, and just um, loving myself and saying, well, this is where I'm at. I'm on a journey and I'm going to get to that journey, but this is where we're at right now. And absolutely. I can't, can't agree with you more. And isn't it interesting that if we first accept Whoever is coming into this, mm. say, okay, you've got stuff going on. I'm feeling, so for instance, I've, I've got a big, uh, a big uh, speech or something. And before it, I'm, I'm becoming very nervous, which is normal. I become anxious, which is normal. And I start to uh, play all the stuff where the last time I, I, I forgot what I was about to say and I, and I mm. stood there and everybody stared at me and it was horrible. But rather, then say, say to yourself, stop. You know, just, just stop for a moment. Take a deep breath. And, and accept, okay, I've got this stuff going on. Be curious mm -hmm. about it. 
say, you know, I wonder how it would be if I let that stuff go on and not try to stop it, mm. but just took my attention, just like when I'm mindful mm -hmm. and be mindful in this moment, just like when I'm mindful in the meditation, be mindful in this moment and allow myself to show up who I am right now mm. and just be with these other human beings mm. in life mm. right now. Mm. And what's interesting, David, is that, to me anyway, is that just that mere act of acceptance and being curious mm. can, despite all the stuff that a moment ago mm. probably was going on in that person's head or in my head or whatever, mm. but now, rather than being fighting against it and, and, and it being in the way, mm. it's just part of the landscape. Mm. It's like the, 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 you walk outside, you got the trees, the mountains, the, the storm may come up, it may go. Mm. The, the, the tapestry of what's going on around us, it just becomes more of that. Yeah. And, and it stops being the, the harbinger of death mm. that, is, that feels like. Because mm. once someone feels that catastrophic about something about to happen, then you know they usually feel like they're going to die. Mm. Now, Public speaking is not a life or death situation last time mm -hmm. I checked. Mm -hmm. But on the scale of stressors, <laughs> it is the number one. Wow. The number one. Yeah. Other than it beats out death of a spouse, beats out death of a child in terms of things that create the most fear and, and mo the, the most fear in the most people. Yeah. And it just goes to show how once the limbic system has hijacks our, 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 our situation, the limbic, system, the limbic system is basically where the emotions uh, are created. And I'm oversimplifying greatly, but, but we can become limbic system hijacked, emotionally hijacked the situation when we think that we're supposed to get one type of outcome, but we're not we're getting another type of outcome, or we think that we're going to get another type of outcome. And then we're also the race is worrying and the rumination and it takes us totally off our game. And then that's 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 the moment that we start to screw up. Mm. But to your point, if we approach it from the standpoint of acceptance and curiosity mm. and, and self-compassion, yeah, then say, well, you know what? I'm not going to make these things go away today mm. in mm -hmm. this in this moment. Maybe over time they will, but mm -hmm. so let me be compassionate about. Mm what I'm doing. Let me show up and let me be who I am in this moment yeah. now. Gotcha. The yeah. best to the best that I can be. Mm -hmm. And it's it's wondrous what can happen after that. Mm -hmm. I mean it, just just being there. Yeah. And, be, and have an opportunity to look in other people's faces. Yeah. And I in the eyes of other folks. It's and true. be and be with them truly. There's really a place of being compassionate for ourselves, isn't there? Absolutely. And, and you know, that's such a great point, too, when you talk about compassion for ourselves, not, not just compassion for um, the moment, mm. but compassion in the sense that and, and compassion also part of acceptancy that, you know, I am right now the full culmination of everything that I've ever thought, mm. every person yeah. I've ever, every aspect mm. of myself that has ever come forward. Mm. And within that pile of stuff, it's like a little boy that always wanted a pony, and his dad always promised him one, and he walked past the uh, uh, this pile of ho horse manure, and he says, and he starts to jump into it, and he gets really happy, and he says, what are you doing? He says, well, hey, there's got to be a pony in here somewhere. I mean, it's that, it's that sense of looking at the best of what we have and focusing on all of the beauty that mm -hmm. comes out of us and has come out of us yeah. in that moment. Mm -hmm. And some of that beauty has been created as a direct response to the, the, some of the ugliness that came from the abuse or mm -hmm. from the ugliness that came from the things that didn't work out, the ugliness that came from times when we did fail. Yes. But because we went through it, we had that sense of, um, enlightenment, that sense mm. of uh, epiphany, that sense of aha moment mm. that wouldn't have been necessarily that soon or maybe with that 
level of intensity without that experience. Mm. So as a culmination, when we, when, we, when we approach whatever we're approaching, it's a culmination of, of everything that we have. Say, wow, you know, I'm okay. Mm. I'm okay. And, and I appreciate those times that were dark. I don't want to go through them again. Mm. But they provided a transformation opportunity for me right. that I'll never forget. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, we could talk about this subject alone and the benefit of uh, really integrating these principles into our, you know, our daily life. Um, I know one of the things I just was reminded of, reminded myself of last week was Michael Singer in his book, The Untethered Soul, he says, you are not the thoughts. You are the observer of your thoughts. And I, when I, when I really consider that, I think, yeah, I really agree with that. I'm not my thought. It's, it's me observing it. It's a great place of release to sort of say, yeah, sometimes the, those thoughts are crazy. Sometimes they're, they're better. But I'm still not those thoughts. I, I'm different to those and I'm observing them. And those, those thoughts can change over time and experience. And, 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 and David, they, all, they often do. And, and, but the thing is, it's like what I, one of the, I'll share this with uh, you and your, your uh, listeners uh, about anxiety. Mm. One of the ways that I help people with anxiety is to have them take the, the worry and realize one is that worry's job is to keep you uh, to be in control. Worry has to be in control. And worry wants to make sure that you're okay because it wants that you know that you got to watch out. This is going to happen. This is going to happen. This is going to happen. So it's not as though worry is trying to uh, screw things up and make things mm. horrible. Mm. Worry is, it, it has a job. It's trying to preserve us. But worry is not you. Worry is just a, a part of you, one of those parts that is trying to help, although not very doing a very good job. So what I what I share with my clients is that give worry a name. Mm. By giving that part a name, you are objectifying. Mm-hmm. Once you objectify it, it is putting distance between yourself and these thoughts. And, mm. and, and, and it has just to do with what you said a moment ago. It's not, it becomes clear that, that these are not my thoughts. Mm-hmm. These are thoughts about a part of me that's trying to make sure that I'm surviving. It's just not doing a very good job. Mm. So look, uh, John or or Gene or whatever your name that we, whatever the name that we put on this separate uh, this conversation, this uh, mm. this these thoughts, mm. this worry, is that right now you need to go and sit down for a moment because I've got mm. some very important things to do. So not now, or whatever you want to say them. Yeah. But but the mere fact of objectifying them, it helps you to begin to manage them. Right. Because one of the things that people think is that I shouldn't be anxious. Mm-hmm. I shouldn't have worry thoughts. Well, mm-hmm. that's like saying uh, I shouldn't have uh, a cold. Well, you have a cold in response to a pathogen that is that is that has invaded your system, mm-hmm. and your body is fighting it off. Mm-hmm. If you didn't have the cold. Then it could be much worse. You could just, you know, be your demise. Yeah. But the point is, is that even though you don't like the cold, that 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 brief response your body's having to mm. this invader mm. is that is essential. And it this process of fighting off is is also important with regard to like an anxiety. Anxiety mm. is going to be there. It's just how we're going to work. How we're going to manage it. Right. Mm-hmm. Oh, it's wonderful thoughts to finish off our talk, Woody. I really appreciate you for your time very much. Um, it is this moment, you know, just it, I'm, I'm humble, humbled to uh, just think that we've had such a, uh, a, a chance to be able to uh, talk about these things and the benefits been that uh, some great, uh, some great content there for other people. Um, but thank you for your time and um, have a look at Woody's book. And the contact details are in the show notes. But um, any final words, Woody? Or would well, you know, David, I miss you. We we'll talked a long time, mm-hmm. and absolutely correct that um, I feel a sense of greater connection. And why? Because of the intimacy of the talks. Mm-hmm. It's not just a day. Mm-hmm. 
um, the other times when, when when you when you meet someone, I don't mean just meet them for the first time, but when you when you meet with someone, and you meet them showing up uh, who they are, and you sh- and, and, and and you showing up who you are, mm. and you're having a, a, a connection that is uh, intimate, that is uh, that is connected. Mm. It really speaks to part of our DNA. Mm. And part of our DNA is that we need, we must, we require connection with one another yeah. as human beings. And it and it um, it is invigorating. It is, um, and I think humbling is a good word because mm. uh, especially when you have gotten into parts of the conversation that you were, were revealing. Mm. It, it, uh, what Brene Brown talks about, vulnerability. Mm. Vulnerability is a big aspect Mm. of being co- in connection being in in communication with another i mean real communication yeah so uh i really want to thank you for the opportunity to come in and play full out with you for a little while and yeah. have some good conversation i'm looking forward to uh another uh, an opportunity to, to do that with you. either you this me. or maybe, maybe you come and uh, come out to la again sometime yeah certainly well um you know we had our first man shit event planned which turned into a virtual event but um in la and uh, you know we were both going to attend that and looking forward to running those events that's still the plan and um and also because of my interest in trading i know so many great quality men and and guys in that industry um you're the first but um, i'm going to be interviewing other specialists in this area because i know that trading is something that's fascinating to so many guys and women but so many guys because they maybe incorrectly have construed it as Away, you know, at the moment when the market's at all-time highs and it's charging ahead, you can kind of think, wow, that looks easy over there. Um, what we're talking about is it's not easy at any time. And those people who have just bought stocks, for example, and um, I've, I've got you know various people talk to me about their trading skills, and I think, well, hang on, let's be honest, you're, you're buying and hoping, and, and there's a lot more to trading than actually that. And really thank you for what you've illuminated today, and I'm looking forward to building more content specifically about trading and you'll be part of that going forwards Woody so I really appreciate your time my friend we'll never do it thank you so much David